Right now we'll read uh, Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through verse number 4. Brother Colston. We'll read responsibly these verses, please. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. We're in the book of Romans, and uh, in this beginning of the year, our theme for the year is His Righteousness. And you'll find that that is a major theme of the Bible, righteousness. Uh, the Bible tells us all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It's profitable for several reasons. For doctrine, that's what's right. Do you want to know what's right? Look in the Bible. You know the right way to be a good husband, to be a good son, or a good daughter, a good friend, a good neighbor, uh, to be a good employee, a good employer? The Bible tells you what's right to do. It's also there for reproof. That's what's not right. It's to say when you do something wrong, don't do that, John. That's not right. God gave us the Bible to tell us what's right, what's not right. Number three, how to get right when I mess up. How many have ever messed up? Would you raise your hand with me? Both of those hands. Come on now, I'm just joking. Yeah, all of us are a bunch of dirt pots. <laughs> we got more dirt in our pot than we probably deserve, or we should, but we just all got issues. And when we do something wrong, how do we get it straightened out? That's what the Bible tells you. I had a precious lady ask me this morning, she said, Pastor, I have a conflict with someone. What am I supposed to do with that? And the answer to that is, what does God want you to do with that? He said, I want you to confess it and pray for that person that you can be healed. He said, I want you to confess it. If there's something you need to apologize about it, go do it. The Spirit of God's going to impress you and apologize. The Satan, the world, the flesh, and the devil are going to say, they deserve it. You hold that grudge. You need to make them pay. Aren't you glad God doesn't have an attitude about us? Yeah. So it tells us how to get right when we make something uh, a mess. And then lastly, it's instruction in righteousness. It's how to stay right. Well, God is all about righteousness. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What's the right thing? that God wants you it to be a good idea when every Christian programs his mind, when he has a dilemma, when he has something to do, he asks himself, what does God want me to do? Not to what I feel like doing, not what I think is best, not, not to what I want, but what does God want me to do? The Bible says the way of the Lord, it's perfect. You do God's things, God's way, it's hard on the front end, and it's always better on the back end. Sin is always easy to do, and it pays to do it in a bad way. The first day of sin is always your best day. The first day of holding that grudge, that was your best day. You're going to find bitterness is going to start eating you up. That first drink you ever had of alcohol, that was your best day. You keep on going, and alcohol will make a fool out of you. That first cuss word you, you said in anger, that was your best day. You keep on foul mouth and that kind of thing, you're going to cause all kinds of destruction. The first day of sin is always the best day of sin. The first day of doing right is always the hardest day of doing right. You start learning to do what's right, be a soul winner. You start learning to give, you start learning to serve. That's hard. You keep doing it, it gets easier and easier and more pleasant and their blessings start coming in. Your first day of saying, you know, I'm going to be faithful to church. I'm not just going to sit soaking sour. I'm going to find a place to serve the Lord. I'm going to find something to do. That's the happiest Christians in the work of the Lord. God is about righteousness, and especially when it comes to salvation. Today, I want to talk to you a little bit about righteousness. That is our theme of the month is salvation and His righteousness and we've gone to the book of Romans this morning. Your Bible is one book with 66 books inside. It begins with Genesis, how God started the human race with Adam and Eve, how he started the, uh, the Hebrew race with Abraham and Sarah. It concludes with the book of the Revelation, and that is a book of future events. 
except for verses, chapters 1 through 3, uh, the book of the Revelation is written of things that were, that's Jesus, things that are, the seven churches, and the things that will be uh, in the future is how God concludes the Bible. 39, the books were written before Jesus came. The last 27 were written after Jesus went back to heaven. But the book of Romans, someone says, it's the book that changed the world. It's only 16 chapters in this book. It's not terribly long. But it's unbelievable um, theses on, on the thought of God. It's a, a book of theology. God shares with us His way. And really, it's, it's divided in several chapters. We're going to talk about it on Wednesday night. And I plan to start talking about it a little bit this week on the, on the radio program, Grace to Grow. But on Wednesday night, we're going, to, we're going to look at it as a survey. But I wanted just to kind of give you a thought about it today in the book of Romans chapter 10. But Romans has, has an outline. The first three chapters, one through three, the theme is sin. He says there are sins that are really dastardly, perverted, abominable sins in chapter one. Rank sins. Chapter two is religious sins. People who say, well, I go to church, I do this, I've done that. But they've got sins of hypocrisy. Sins of prejudice, sins of judgmental spirits, all kinds of things that go on there. He said, you know, you, you want to judge somebody else, you need to judge yourself too. In chapter 3, he said, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everybody's a sinner. Chapters 4 and 5 speak of salvation. Sin, salvation. Salvation by faith in Jesus Christ, plus nothing, minus nothing. The hope of eternal life is not in our works, it's in Christ and his work. It's in faith in what he did. And he's going to talk about it in 4 and 5. Chapters uh, 6, 7, and 8 are chapters of sanctification. They tell us how we can live a victorious life. We got a problem. We're, after we get saved, we're still sinners. And chapter 6 talks about that. Chapter 7 talks about how that the law of God reminds us of our sin and in our flesh we can't please the Lord. Chapter 8 talks about the spirit-filled life. And then when we walk in the flesh, we'll do the, we can't please God that way. We need to walk in a spirit-filled life. And then chapters 9, 10, and 11 are somewhat parenthetical, but they have to deal with the sovereignty of God in relation to the Jewish nation. Like it or lump it, God has chosen, he's only given one country a piece of property, and that's Israel. It's only a sliver right now. But one day Israel is going to be Lebanon and Syria and part of Egypt and Jordan. That whole area is, uh, it's only the size of maybe Rhode Island at this present time. It's surrounded by 13 Muslim countries that hate it. Anti-Semitism is on the rise in the world, the hatred of the Jews against the Jews. One of the reasons is, it's not the Jewish people, it's God of the Jews. People have a problem, and you can, you can just remind yourself, it's through the Israelite people, the Jewish people, that God gave us two things that you need desperately. Number one, He gave us our Savior. Jesus Christ came through the lineage of, of the Jewish nation. Number two, he gave us our scriptures. You got a Bible in your hand, you can thank the Israelites for that. You can thank the Jewish people for that. And God is not done with the Jewish people. Matter of fact, when Jesus comes back, I think there's going to be a revival of many Jews coming to know the Lord as their Savior. I believe that with all of my heart. God's not done with the Jewish people. However, the Bible is very clear. Jesus came into his own, but his own, they did not accept him. At his first coming, the Jewish nation as a whole uh, did not accept the Lord. Now, there are Jews in this auditorium who are Messianic Jews who have trusted Jesus as their Savior. And there are all over the world people like that. But as a whole, the Jewish people have rejected the Lord, but he has not cast them away. He still loves them, and I think the Bible principle, and I do not believe with the replacement theology that is propagated today, that, that Jews have no interest in Israel. God is not working with Israel. I think he is in unbelievable supernatural ways right now, and he has a plan for that in the future. 
But in chapters 9, 10, 11, a lot of people's theology gets uh, very skewed there, and they get a little bit squirrely in those chapters. Because it talks about how God's approach is to Jewish people. Now, the man who wrote the book of Romans, his name is Paul. And Paul gives his pedigree and tells a little bit about himself in the book of Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse number 7 through verse 11. And people were giving him criticism about who he was. He said, Listen, let me just tell you, if you want to stack up your works and stack up who you are, I can, I can, I can, I can uh, go toe-to-toe with the best of you. He goes, I am of the tribe of Benjamin. I studied under the school of Gamaliel. I memorized Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, quoted in many times in, the, in, the, in his writings. He knew many of the Psalms by heart. He would attend church every single day as a Pharisee. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was a tribe of Benjamin. He, had, he, had, he, had, he was a blue blood. And he said, but I count all those things but lost. I count it as refuge for the, for the knowledge of knowing Jesus. And he was a Jew that God converted and brought to the Lord. But, in, but, uh, but God is going to use chapters 9, 10, 11 of Romans to, to get people's head screwed on straight about salvation, about the Jewish world, because most of us are not Jews. Most of us are Gentiles. And we need to understand how God is dealing with them. And then chapters 12 through 16 is about service. It teaches you, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. He says, let's talk about service. And from chapters 12 through 16 is service. So you see the outline, sin, salvation, sanctification, the sovereignty of God, and serving the Lord with your life. It ends chapter 8 talking about how that nothing can separate from the love of God. Chapter 12, he says, now, because of that, serve the Lord. Serve him wholly. Serve him with all your heart. Cooperate with your brothers and sisters. Use your spiritual gifts. Don't spend your time uh, trying to recompense evil for evil, but do that which is good in the sight of all men and to the Lord and so forth and so on. It tells us in chapter 13, we have a problem with our, our respect for police officers in our day. And there's no doubt there, is, there are bad police officers, like there's bad doctors, like there's bad pastors. Uh, but I will tell you this, police and, uh, and the authorities that exercise that, God ordained that. And you can read it about it in Romans chapter 13. He tells them, listen, if you're going to serve me, you're going to respect those in civil authority. He tells them about how to do that. He's going to tell me in chapter 14 and 15, if you're strong in the faith, well, support those that are weak. Love other people. Don't be offensive to people. Stay on the high road of holiness. People are watching you. If you, don't, if you pick and choose when you're going to go to church, you pick and choose your lifestyles. And when people are looking at you and you've got Sunday school members and Sunday school teachers and kids looking at you, you ought to be on the high road of holiness. Don't offend somebody else. Well, I've got liberty. I can do whatever I want. Yes, you can, Spanky, but you're going to hurt other people. And he says, listen, if, if the Apostle Paul says, if people are, have a problem with me eating meat in this day, he said, if, 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 if it hurts another brother or sister, then I don't have to have meat the rest of my life. I'll be a vegetarian if that'll help you. You know what that shows? Great love. He didn't care about him. He cared about someone else. And he'll teach us that service is, should be selfless. It should be looking to help somebody else. But in chapter 10, we have here, if you're a soul winner, you use Romans chapter 10 probably in giving people the gospel. Let's look at, if we can please, just a few thoughts. And of course, uh, Paul is a Jew, and he's speaking to the Jews, and he says in chapter 9, he goes, if I could die and go to hell, and, and my people, the Hebrews, could go to heaven, he said, I would do it. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not there yet. <laughs> He said, I would wish myself to be accursed if I could just see that my people come to know the Lord. But you see a passion that's coming on. Chapter 10, he says something similar. Look at verse number 1, would you please? Aren't you glad you're in church this morning? Aren't you glad we can look around the Word of God and see that? I've, I've been in China where people are coming in. They have to trickle into the house, church. 
because they can't be seen by people and people are, are, are snitching on them and telling them that people are gathering in a church. They, they kind of have to be quiet. They have to sing their songs quietly. They can't sing out like we did this morning. They have to sing, yes, Jesus loves me. They sing it quietly. They have to baptize people in the bathtub. Take a video camera and put it in the, in the bathroom, watch people get baptized in the front room. They see it on the screen. Just to see that and, and just know that, you know, then they have to leave in, in sections because they don't want to cause un, undue attention to them. We're so blessed, aren't we? Have a Bible and to walk into a church service and to sing as loud as we want to sing. It grieves me. Some people say they're Christians. They won't sing a, a word of the song. I don't understand that. They like, they like ACDC, but they won't sing this. They like music. They play it in their trucks and their cars. But they come to church and look here like, a, like they've been chewing on a lemon or something. Well, we ought to have opportunities. We have opportunities to worship. We ought to worship the Lord. Glorify Him. I don't know where that came from, but let's go to the Bible. How about that? <laughs> Verse number one, read it out loud with you, would you please? He's speaking to brethren, and of course, those are people that are saved. And let's continue. Ready? Brethren... My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel. So he says, listen, talking to his brethren, people who are saved, he said, listen, my heart's desire and my prayer for my country is that they might be saved. So we know that this, God is not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. God loves you and he wants you to be saved. He wants your neighbors to save. Notice the two concepts he has here. My heart's what? And my prayer. Let me ask you, do you have that, friend? Do you have those two things that people around you would be saved? Are you concerned about your people? Are you concerned about your family? Are you concerned about your neighborhood? Are you concerned about your race? Or do you have a heart's desire and a prayer that God would save them? Driving around my neighborhood today, and I've got a neighbor here. I'm so grateful that Lewis would come today with us. I'm driven by his house many times. Today is a great day for us to have Lewis with us. But I oftentimes pray for my neighbors. Last night, my, my daughter Lydia is getting married here on July 31st, and I said, Hey, you want to walk around the block with me? And she said, Yes. And we held hands and walked around our little circle and went by each of the houses, and my heart was praying for them. I pray for them every day. They're my people. They live in my neighborhood. They don't live in your neighborhood. They live in my neighborhood. And I've, I've got a responsibility. I'm looking for opportunities to talk to them about the Lord. There should be a desire in me. There should be a desire in you. You got a mom or dad that's not saved. You got a friend at work that's not saved. You got someone in your neighborhood that's not saved. You got someone within your influence. There ought to be something inside of you, like Apostle Paul says, my desire and my prayer is that they could be saved. We don't talk too much about the word saved too much. You, sometimes you go out to people, and it used to be common knowledge what saved meant. For the average person, if you go say, are you saved? They'll say, well, yeah, well, I almost got in a wreck one time. About bit it with that. You know, you talking about that? No. Yeah, I was drowning one time. No, we're not talking about that. We're talking about being saved from sin that would exile you from God and, and reconciled to Him. He said, man, I, I have a desire and I have a prayer. I like praying for the lost, because when you pray for the lost, you get more concerned about. You deepen your prayer, your prayer to win people to Christ, and you're going to start winning people to Christ. It's much more a passion than it is a method. And if I'm not winning people to Christ, and you're not getting the gospel out to people, it's because we do, we lack a desire, and we lack a prayer life. Is any wonder why prayer is so difficult as a discipline? I don't know about you, and I've said this with you before, but Boy, I can watch a ball game for two hours. My team can lose, and I still had a good time. I didn't think about my car being dirty. I didn't think about mowing my grass. I didn't think about any other responsibility. Just watch a football game or watch a basketball game. But you know, when I start saying, you know, I'm going to take some time to pray, everything in the world comes to my mind. And I don't even wash dishes very often, but I think about dirty dishes need to be washed. I think about my car needs to be clean. I think about my yard needs to be mowed. I think I've got to text that person. I've got to call that person. I've got to write that note. I've got to visit that person. Anything to get me out of prayer. 
Because in prayer, it's not a one-way street, it's a two-way street. Well, I'm talking to God, God's Spirit's talking to me. And He's burdening my heart for the lost. How we ought to make sure that our desire and our prayer is that people come to know Christ as their Savior. That's kind of been the theme of the day, not by design. I think just because the Holy Spirit's trying to help us to be more uh, conscious of a world that needs Jesus. Let's look, if we can, please, to the next verse, verse number 2. I bear them record, or I make a point of this, that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. He goes, I, I have to hand it to them. My Jewish brothers and sisters, the nation of Israel, they do have a zeal for God. How many of you have ever been to Israel before? Would you raise your hand? Anybody been to Israel? You'll see that off the, the, temple, uh, the temple mount is the western wall, and there's a room over there, and people will come in, they go through all kinds of rituals. They've got things on their head. They'll, they'll go in there and read out loud some of the things and, of the Torah and so forth and so on. They'll wash their hands. They'll teach every. They'll go to the wall and they'll stand there and they'll pray. They'll rub their face and their nose sometimes on that wall. They'll put prayers inside the wall to God. Oh, they, they know God. They have a knowledge. They have, they, they, they have a zeal. I'm amazed that people will go around and propagate a false doctrine that Jesus is not God. There's no hell. Only a certain amount of people go to heaven. They'll hand out watchtowers. They'll hand out magazines. They'll stand 4 o'clock in the morning at the train station and just stand there and wait for any interested person. They will walk the streets of our city. People will climb on their hands and knees in temples in India and in Italy and other places and do whatever they can and beat themselves and try to prove to God they have a, a zeal. And what's sad is that people who have the truth have less zeal than people who don't have the truth. You know, they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. They don't know the right God. And that's why the Bible is going to say later in this passage of Scripture, now then faith cometh by how can they call upon him who they have not heard? A lot of people, they don't know the truth because no one's ever set them down and explained that to them. No one's ever said, listen, let me walk you through that. Oh, how we need to get the gospel to people. But look at verse number three. The Bible says this, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness. Ignorant, we use some, if you say something derogatory to someone, you're so ignorant. But in the Bible, it means they just don't know. They are not aware of the righteousness of God, but going about to establish their, would you read the next two words to me? Own righteousness, not having not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. What would you say the key word of verse 3 is? Righteousness. He says, here's what happens. They have a zeal for God, but they don't know Him. And they are, they're unknowing, they're ignorant of the God's righteousness. Now, what is God's righteousness? It's his son. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, you may want to put that down the margin of your Bible. The Bible says this, that God made him, Jesus, to be sin for us, who Jesus didn't have any sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He became sin so we could become righteous in Jesus. When the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his, he's talking about seek him. The Bible says he's not only, he, if, if my, in 1 John chapter 2, he says, my little children, I write these things unto you that you sin not. But if any, be, any sin, he has an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So what is the righteousness of God? He said they're ignorant of God's righteousness, which is his son. And they go about making their own righteousness. Like many of us did in times past, we try to earn our way to salvation. Listen to me. Look up in here real quickly. Get this, get this underlined in red. Mark it down. Make sure you understand this. Eternal life cannot be earned. It is not a reward for the righteous. It's a gift for the guilty. And most of the people that you talk to about Jesus need to understand that principle. If you ask the average person, if I want to go to heaven, how could I do it? 
they would give you a list of things that they have learned or have figured out. They would say, well, you've got to do this, 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 or this. And they're, they're all a list of things to establish your own righteousness. And the Bible's very clear in the book of I, in Isaiah. He says, for our righteousness is as filthy rags, nasty rags, in comparison to the exchange for our sin. No, it's not possible. He said they, they, they're ignorant. They don't know that Jesus is the only way. His righteousness. And they've chosen to establish their own righteousness. And they've rejected and not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God, which is His Son. Look at verse number 5. Thank you for listening. The Bible says, for, uh, verse number 4, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. You can put in your margin, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, He came to fulfill the law, not to... To destroy it. And I want you to look down, if you would please, for sake of time, you can see that he's going to talk about the incarnation that Jesus came, that he rose again. And he's going to talk about that in verse number 9, would you please? And, and I, the way I want you to notice this, salvation is free and it's close. It's near to you. Some of you in the balcony, you're so far from me I can't even distinguish your face. You can't see my face is up on the screen, and I'm sorry about that. I got a face made for radio. <laughs> but you know, you're far from me, but you're not very far from Jesus. Those of you watching on live stream and listening on the radio today, you're far from me and my voice, but you're not far from being saved. The Word of God is in the mouth, and it can be in your heart. Would you look at verse number 8 with me, if you would? But what saith it? The word is what? Nigh thee. Even in thy mouth and thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You can be saved. What do I have to do to be saved? He says, believe in your heart that only Jesus is God's righteousness, his death, burial, and resurrection. His incarnation and His resurrection bring salvation to us. To believe that, that He's God, and that He saved you, and then you can be saved. Look at verse number 10. Read it out loud with me, would you please? For with the heart and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. See, Pastor, how can someone be saved? First of all, it's the freeness of salvation. It's the nearness of salvation. And the possibility is so easy because God did all the work. He said we must believe in our heart that only Jesus can give us eternal life. And we must confess with our mouth. It's a heart belief and a mouth confession. Whosoever shall call me the Lord shall be saved. I want to read these verses and we'll conclude this morning. Look at verse number 11. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him, on Jesus, shall not be ashamed. Listen, if you're saved already this morning and you've, you've been saved, you should not be ashamed about that. If you're saved and you haven't been baptized, do not let embarrassment keep you from getting baptized. He said, if you believe on me, you know what God called everybody in the New Testament Jesus? He called them publicly. He said, follow me. He called them publicly. He said, you want to be saved? Come to me. All that labor, heavy laden, I'll give you rest. If you're saved, you should not be ashamed to follow the Lord. Amen. Then he says here, for there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. It's a good answer to racism today. God loves people more than anything. Doesn't matter their background, their race, doesn't matter their skin color. He says, I'm not, I'm not partial to anybody. I am rich into all that would call upon me. And whosoever shall call the name of the Lord shall be. You might have remembered this story. I have a little book here they wrote called Saved or Lost. It has a picture of the Titanic on it. And some people that came across the Titanic, Titanic it was a, uh, a ship they said even God himself couldn't sink it. They only did one voyage and didn't make it. But on that ship, there were hundreds of people. Some, they were in first class. They had personal waiters to care for them and help them with whatever they want, anything they want to drink, anything they want to eat, anything they need an extra pillow. 
Some people went with a backpack and they were down in the steerage. They didn't have a servant. They were the servants. They were doing stuff just to be on the ship with them. But you know, the truth of the matter is, they had different people in different classes, but at the end, there were just two classes. When that ship went down, there was just two classes, saved and lost. Some people go to hell first class. They go to hell from the, from the pews of First Baptist Church. They know all of it up here. It just never did come here. They never really came to know the Lord as their Savior. I want to encourage you today, if you're here and you're not sure you're saved, then you need to get saved. If you're saved, you need to follow the Lord in baptism. If you're saved and you've been baptized, you ought to be concerned about getting other people saved. And uh, ask God to help us with that. Because God is, is rich into all that would call us.